Well, thanks everybody. Let's see if we can have some fun this afternoon. This is the perfect position. Uh, you're all full, you're ready for a nap. Uh, we're gonna turn the lights down a little bit. Uh, nothing like the graveyard shift to uh, get up here and talk about something exciting like a business operating system. Well, I'm the kind of person that uh, if, I, uh, if I invest in something, I don't do it part way. Um, I've made every mistake you can make in business a minimum of 25 times with, with great enthusiasm every time I did it. When I start, when I start believing in something, um, it, my beliefs are pretty deep and I'm willing to commit to the things that I commit to. What I've learned uh, from Dr. Deming, and it's been repeated and reinforced in most of the presentations that have taken place today, is that uh, without a name, there can be no system. And without you having an understanding of the aim of the system that you're a part of, you can't proceed. You do not know what to do. You don't know what the reason is for the existence of that system. So in keeping with that, um, I am unable to proceed unless I understand uh, what the aim is of uh, two different systems and I need to ask someone that's an expert. So I want to ask uh, Kevin Cahill um, what the aim of the Deming Institute is, and then I'd like to ask him what the aim of this, uh, the research uh, paper conference is. And he assured me that he could provide that to me so that we could proceed. So what I want to do is I want to try to make sure that everything that we do, because we're committed uh, to support accomplishing the aim of the Deming Institute, and we're committed to supporting the aim of this conference. So come on up, Kevin, or get a microphone. I don't care how you do it. What if I forgot? <laughs> now, aim of the Deming Institute to foster an understanding of the system of profound knowledge to advance commerce, prosperity, and peace. <laughs> I knew that would have that effect on Gordon. Yeah, kind of brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? <laughs> and what was the other one you wanted me to do? What we're doing here. We are exploring new concepts and ideas to create curiosity, interest, and awareness about the Deming philosophy and hopefully lead to an interest in deeper learning about these ideas. Good. <clears throat> the reason that that's important is it allows us to make decisions about things that are in concert with those two aims and things that are in conflict with those two aims. It allows you to make decisions. It allows you to include things. It allows you to exclude things. Uh, not to settle old scores or because of personal preferences. Um, it helps us uh, remember uh, why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish, and hopefully it focuses our, our actions and our efforts uh, to keep us on the right course. Um, I think those aims are probably gonna be with us for a long time. They've been around for a long time and I hope they're gonna be around for a lot longer. And so it kind of guides us. As I said, I take things to heart, and so um, what we agreed to do is we agreed to let someone else uh, kind of give some observations on a company that we own. I'm going to um, describe the company that we own because the person that's giving their observations has never been to our company, they have no idea what our company does, other than some cursory understanding that they got. Um, and they're gonna try to interpret uh, something that we use at our company that we think is the basis uh, for allowing us to, in a very, very orthodox way, uh, apply and take advantage of the system of profound knowledge. Uh, in this company, it's called Jet Hot LLC. It's a, uh, it's a coding company. They do highly, we do highly engineered coatings. We have two plants, uh, one in Burlington, North Carolina, 
147,000 square feet. We have a little less than 100 employees uh, between the two plants. We have another one in Oklahoma City, or both sides of the Mississippi. Um, we bought the company out of bankruptcy, uh, the assets of the company out of bankruptcy in 2010. At the time that we purchased it from previous management, the company had uh, top line revenue of a little bit less than a million dollars. Uh, the reason we were able to buy it is they had debt of one billion dollars. <throat> it was being, uh, being run by people uh, with a traditional management belief system. And they kept thinking their problem was they didn't have enough money. So if you want um, money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. And the people that give you money will give you advice. It's kind of not advice. It's a demand. And if you don't live up to those demands, you keep owing back more and more money. And the longer you perpetuate that, the more money you owe. So if you want to know how to get a million dollar operation to have a billion dollars worth of debt, that's a good way to approach it. That's a good way to approach it. So nonetheless, it's been very, very easy. And the company was founded in 1970. It had a good reputation. Um, the reputation, the brand name, uh, everything was neglected. The employees were neglected. The equipment was neglected. And um, so we were able to um, buy the assets out of a bankruptcy. And it was very simple, as you might expect. It was easy to turn around a bankrupt company. All except that part about where um, two days after we learned that we had won the auction and we owned the assets, the landlord let us know that there had been an eviction notice served on the previous management before the bankruptcy filing, and we had 28 days to vacate the facility. We're a sole supplier to companies like Cummins, Harley-Davidson, John Deere, fisher Paykel. Uh, in the case of Cummins, they cannot sell their engines and let them be on the highway if it doesn't have our coating on it. We're part of the pollution control certification for Cummins diesel engines. Um, but that wasn't gonna be too much of a problem because a couple days later, the senior purchasing uh, person from Cummins showed up to tell us he was gonna pull the contract because he didn't know who we were and he couldn't afford to have his parts tied up by a trustee or some creditor's committee. Uh, so he was gonna have to uh, pull the contract. Uh, the contract was uh, in excess of 65% of the business of the company. So we got off to a great start. There was no problems. It was, we were just lucky. Everything came together. I was able to uh, convince this customer uh, he brought bag men with him, guys with briefcases and notifications. They have documents in there that, with signatures on it notifying you of the intent to terminate the contract and blah, blah, blah. So I asked him if I could get him to step into a conference room, um, and I'd like to understand what he was going to do. He said, well, there's another supplier that has uh, offered to build a coating line to coat parts. And I said, have they ever been in the coding business before? His answer was, no, but they've assured us what they can do it. Um, I said, how long is it going to take? They've assured us they can do it in 30 days. I said, have they ever been in the coding business before? And uh, so I said, uh, so um, are they going to do it for free? Nope. We're going to give them a million dollars so they can build a coding line in less than 30 days, and they've never been in the coding business before. I said, well, at least you have a solution that has no risk in it. That's why you get the big money, I guess. I said, I know this is crazy. I think I already know what the answer is going to be, but um, I'm crazier than you, so just hear me out. Um, what if I were to buy two months' worth of your material on my dime, buy the castings, have them machined, bring them to my facility, 
put the coatings on it that I know you have to have or you stop your production lines, and then I'll put that two months worth of material in a warehouse someplace, yours someplace, yours, mine, or some independent warehouse, and only you will have the keys. The very first thing that will give you is that will give you 60 days worth of insurance. Along with that, I won't stop the production, so you won't suffer any loss of parts during the 30 days uh, that you were gonna have anyway. He said, well, what are you gonna do? I said, well, I'm gonna go find another manufacturing facility. I'm gonna build an identical coating line, identical to or better than the coating line that's always coated your parts, and um, I'm going to uh, get it up and running, and I promise you I won't tear down the existing coating line no matter what the landlord does because we have steel doors and steel door jams. If I weld the door shut, he can't get in and throw me out. And uh, I said, in addition to that, I will go to Oklahoma City and I will reprocess uh, the, the operation we have in Oklahoma City to be identical to the one that's currently coating your parts. So you're gonna have uh, 60 days worth of safety stock. I'm gonna continue running production for 30 days. I'm gonna find a new facility. I'm gonna put all the leasehold improvements in it. I'm gonna build brand new uh, production lines in the new facility uh, because I can't tear down the one that I have. And, um, and I'll do the same thing in Oklahoma City. And all I want you to do is wait that same 30 days before you pull, off the, con pull the contract. If I fail to do any of those things, all the stuff is yours, you're right where you were before, but you have an extra 30 days worth of material. Boy, that was a long silence as he looked at me. And uh, finally he said something. He said, I, I'm older than him, but he said, young man, <laughs> with all of the resources that our company has, we're thousands of times larger than you. I don't think our organization could pull off what you're asking me to consider. But I'm going to let you try. Shit. <laughs> now what? <laughs> so, so we went eight miles down the road. We found a building. It had been vacant for five years. We took the employees that had been working in a bankrupt company. Uh, we told them what the circumstance was, asked them if uh, they thought we could pull all this off, and they gave us the standard answer, the same answer that you get if you ask a six-year-old why he got a, a C on coloring. Huh? I said, are you willing to try? And he said, yes, we're willing to try. Um, I'm happy to report to you that three and a half weeks later, there was a new manufacturing facility. The customer came and uh, certified it as being capable. Uh, both plants were retooled. Um, at one point, we didn't think we were gonna make it because as a part of our coating process, we have to use an infrared oven. We called to have an infrared oven sent over. The manufacturer of the infrared oven said he would be happy to send us an oven. I said, okay, I'll send a truck over. He said, send a truck over? It, we've got a four month lead time. So my people came to me, the way I'm sure your employees come to you and there's something inside the business and they look like a kid that just you know, hit a baseball through a window. Um, we got a problem. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, we can't make it. Why not? Um, we can't get an infrared oven. Throw money at them. We tried. We ain't gonna make it. Said, well, you think there's any possibility it could be done by anyone? Nope. I said, good. So, since no one can do it, and we're a bunch of no ones, go get the Grangers. Uh, what are we gonna do? We're going to build an infrared oven. We've never built an infrared oven before. You know that guy you talked to with a four-month lead time? At one point, he'd never built one either. 
So he was going to sell us an infrared oven that's four stages. The way you cure our coatings is time and temperature. And the way you get the time is the speed of a line going through the oven. And so that controls your production. So if you have more stages in the oven, you can run the line faster. And so instead of getting a four-stage oven, we decided we'd build a seven-stage oven. And it was all built by our people inside, the people that were running that bankrupt company. They built it. Everything was certified. We never missed any shipments. They were, never had to use the safety stock. And all of the problems that had to be solved were addressed and were solved by the very same people that were working in a bankrupt company up to that point. As a result of our, of our folks' ability to perform, um, uh, we now are one of the few companies uh, that export to China. So China makes castings, they machine castings, they ship it from China to Burlington, North Carolina. We coat it and then ship it back to them. I, I can't imagine how that can be cost effective, but that's what they do. And that is, that may be the smallest of accomplishments that if I started down a list that I could cite for you that the folks at this table, the team that they're a part of, have done over the last four years. The business has grown by a factor of seven over four years. Um, we're the gorilla in the marketplace. We've innovated new products, uh, new processes. Um, and when I say we, them. And uh, we could not have done it uh, without having a common language, constancy of purpose in pursuit of a single management theory. Um, our game plan, our business plan, is printed in a book called The New Economics. If it's not in there, we don't do it. And we knew we were going to need um, we were going to need technology support to do it. And instead of doing what most companies do, which is buy software, which is designed based on the the um, the thought of a software developer about how some generic company might operate, and then having to figure out how do I make my company make the software look good, we took a different approach and we developed an application that allowed us to populate software in the way we ran our company. So basically we gave, um, we took the systems diagram, uh, process flow diagrams, failure mode defects analysis, control charts, uh, all of the things that are recommended that we do, um, that is the business operating system for our company. Everything else is subservient to that. So the accounting system doesn't run the company. ERP system does not run the company. Um, a systems diagram of systems, subsystems, processes, FMEAs, control charts run our company. In every department, there, it's the only authorized language. We had some legacy systems and some other things that were helpful to people, so we made it possible for them uh, to keep only the module or the specific uh, page of that software uh, that was helpful to them. We let them have access to it by putting an icon on a, on a directive uh, order within the process flow diagram. All of this will make a lot more sense to you uh, after uh, Dennis does his presentation. And what we have up here, when we get all through, uh, after Dennis uh, describes to you what he saw, and these, uh, everything that Dennis is going to give to you are his observations. We provided him with some slides uh, that he thought would be helpful for him to give the description. And then if there's time at the end, uh, we'll do a live demonstration and we can actually, I think we can log in, uh, Ken, and we can actually uh, access our uh, manufacturing operation and we can put it up on the screen and we can show you what people have to work with at uh, every uh, workstation in our company. And every single bit of content that's in this application came from the people that did the job. It changes constantly. Uh, it's never, it never stays the same. As soon as they see an opportunity to improve on a process, improve the performance of a process, uh, there's a you know, disciplined way they have to go through. Uh, so it never stops. They never stop changing it. 
And um, they have to, you know, I promised them a clean, safe, respectful work environment. I delivered it to them, and I told them their job was to delight customers. And the only thing that was not negotiable, it's a condition of employment that you will delight the customers through the understanding and application of the system of profound knowledge and all the tools that support it. So um, I can't tell you how it's all done, but they can. So uh, I'm gonna let Dennis uh, take the ball and run with it. And you, how could this go wrong? He's never been to the company, he doesn't know what we do, and he's gonna describe it to you. Thank you for that introduction, Gordon. It's interesting that the comments Kevin made in answering the question from Gordon at the beginning of this segment included the word curiosity, and that's certainly what was stimulated in me in October at the Deming Conference in the fall. It was my curiosity as I sat in a session behind Gordon and Cheryl, and I saw over their shoulder something that looked very familiar. They were manipulating something that was familiar to me over many years as I saw Dr. Deming's production viewed as a system diagram, page four of Out of the Crisis, page six in the New Economics. And I saw a more modernized version, a little more detail and a little more complexity. But the elegance of the system that I saw over their shoulders drew me in. I had the opportunity for many years to try to emulate production viewed as a system with some of the rudimentary tools that I used, Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoints and such. But what I saw was an interaction between the people in the system and the system itself. The idea that Gordon articulated that the people in the business had the power to work in the process and to redesign the process with a discipline told me that this was not just an IT system, a piece of technology that I was looking at. It was a way of doing business. And so I'd like to describe for you this jet hot operating system. I think it's appropriate to have the context that Gordon gave, the history of how he found the jet hot company at this bankruptcy stage. It's important, I think, because what I observed is that there was something going on there that was more than just a typical turnaround. This was something founded in profound knowledge. And everywhere I looked, I found more evidence that Dr. Deming was alive and working in the Jet Hot organization. Something about their use of the production viewed as a system fascinated me. I've, I've had a journey in continual improvement that's gone on for many years since that pivotal day in 1980 when I saw the television program that Kevin referred to earlier. It was a journey that at, at some point I would make progress and then I'd have more questions. I know I've had conversations with some of you these last two days about questions that you've had and, and we all pursue our questions and thus we learn. And so as I started to ask questions of Gordon and Cheryl and then I had the blessed introduction to the team through a virtual visit to their site. I had an opportunity to see that this was more than just what the, the two of them had described for me. This is what everybody described. I would tell you that a virtual meeting, a webinar that they connected me to. I had a chance to ask questions of people who were in production. I got introduced to James for the first time, Cindy for the first time, and I had this opportunity to hear from them all about the system of profound knowledge, not just in theory, but in practice. And this is a huge difference that Gordon and the team at Jet Hot have pointed out to me, that they've made the system of profound knowledge, the practice of the 14 points, practicable or practicable, depending on how you pronounce it. They made it workable in their environment, in their culture, and they evolved over time. Clearly, I've heard from Cheryl that they have their share of mistakes just like any organization. 
they have a way that the people who encounter the problem can either correct the problem and notify everybody, they modify the process and notify everybody, and the first thing every day is they sync up with what changes have occurred in the system since I last logged in. This idea is throughout their system, and it's their practice. It is not just the technology. As Gordon said, they develop the operating system, and then they develop the technology to model their system. So I'd like to draw your attention to something that I think is quite different. They've, they've developed not just a tool, they've developed a way of using Dr. Deming's production viewed as a system. They've developed it to fit their process, to fit their company, to fit the way they do business and the way they add value to their customers and to themselves as a system. Gordon was very emphatic in one of our early discussions that he wanted everyone to understand as I proposed to tell their story that what they do is not a silver bullet. He described that really this, this opportunity is to use profound knowledge that without understanding profound knowledge, without understanding and practicing the 14 points, that the operating system, the diagram by itself, isn't a solution. It is integrating it and practicing it that makes the difference. Understanding and practicing the system of profound knowledge as it applies to their world and their business. So I'd like to suggest to you that there are some uh, diagrams here that will be very useful for understanding at a deeper level, and I understand that there is an opportunity you might get to see some of this system, the technology in action. But what they've done is quite remarkable to me, is they've made something that is quite ordinary, extraordinary. The way they do business every day is to focus in on what the people are doing. The organization is very flat. We've had a lot of discussion about the people who do the work in the system are in control of the work. The system helps them get the work done at a very simple level from the system diagram, the production viewed as a system diagram that Dr. Deming first used in 1950, they vary down into whatever is the process that they're going to work in at a particular time. They go even further into the sub-processes and ultimately into the process flow diagrams. It's quite remarkable to see that as they go in to do their daily work, they start at the system level and everything is connected at the system level with one exception, and that would be wherever a process flow diagram connects to another process, they have a link to go follow. What is the effect of what I'm doing on some other process? They also have embedded within those systems, within the technology, they've embedded the linkage to training so that some of the people who are working in the line and teaching other members of the organization how to do a particular process can show them, and then they have a link there to video demonstrations of how to properly spray and coat a part, or how to properly treat a part. And the greater tool of the interaction is their connection and linkage from one part of the system to another. So I'd like to suggest to you that the experience that I've had just by understanding more and asking questions is something I'd like to stimulate an interest in you. These are people who have used Dr. Deming's work. It's interesting that as they annually spend somewhere in the neighborhood of a week training people in the system that they already know, they train them in profound knowledge, and they encourage them to get education in other areas outside of that immediate application. They even spend four hours training people who come in for temporary assignments. A contract person who comes in to staff the reception area gets trained in their operating system. And I've heard this from James, who you'll meet shortly. I've heard it from Cheryl and from Gordon and some of the others that this system, having a common operating system, becomes the lexicon. It is the way they communicate with each other. So I encourage you to ask questions of these folks and think about the impact for perhaps your organization and your enterprise. 
think about this adherence to something that is so fundamental that Dr. Deming put it in the first few pages of both of his most recent books. Figure six on the new economics was a spark that turned around Japan in 1950. It's displayed a system of production, and that's exactly the way Jet Hot uses it. The flow diagram, as Dr. Deming described it in Out of the Crisis, was to look at the effect of customers on the system and suppliers on the system and the people in the system and the process on the system and then the effect that it has as it is a self-regulating mechanism with the help of management. Some would say it's not just management, but leadership that is exhibited in the operations at Jet Hot. So thinking about this continued learning and development and continued adjustment that goes on, I'd like you to see a picture just to help your recollection of Dr. Deming's diagram. Deming's diagram of the system was that at a certain stage we have an innovation or an idea that generates a business. It generates an enterprise. And at another stage we might redesign that system with information that comes from consumer research. We might redesign it based on information we get from inside the system as well as you may recall TJ spoke about this morning. So thinking about this diagram which may be familiar to many of you. This is very much what I was looking at the first time I looked over the shoulders of Gordon and Cheryl. The, the figure six is an operating system. It's not a piece of technology other than the piece of paper and the ink on the page or the pixels that make the image appear on the screen, but it, it is a picture and a way to understand the system in a way that Dr. Deming made clear for us decades ago. And the effective humans are everywhere in the system. And I have to tell you that I've observed this from the interactions that the Jet Hot team has had with their own system. The aim of the system is clear. And this is very clearly part of the Jet Hot story. How the inputs are converted into value during the process. How the end product is delivered to the customer. They're all part and parcel. And you can see this in this prototype diagram that was shared with me. The idea, if you look at this diagram, is that there's an aim and a name of the system. They have inputs, they have outcomes, they have feedback, they have conversion process that converts the inputs into the outputs. And they've identified value-added processes as well as a few things that are not value-added in their process. Now we could talk further about the distinction between non-value added to whom and value added to whom. They're in the system because they add value to the system at some level. But I'd like you to also note that one of the things that I think is an innovation that Jet Hot has uh, documented in their process is they also talk about the span of influence and the span of control that happens within the process or from without. They also started to define some boundaries and clearly have identified some of the metrics that are appropriate for measuring the productivity of the system. So a closer look at the similarities as I discovered in, since October is that the innovation, the design and redesign, all of these critical inputs and outputs, the outcomes if you will, and the measures are very similar. What's the difference in, in, in my view is that the chosen and imposed inputs are things that were not part of Dr. Deming's original work and looking at the desired as well as the undesired outcomes are some additions. Some of these things I've already talked about but I'd like to expose you to what I was looking at over Gordon's shoulder and over Cheryl's shoulder and I'm going to use the um, pointer for a moment I'm presuming that it still works. I'd like you to see the little figures here depict the flow of the process as well as the arrows. And this idea of design and redesign is in virtually the same place that Dr. Deming's diagram had it. You can also see the outcomes. You can see the distribution to the customers. You can also see the distribution from suppliers into the system. What to me is quite a great innovation is this inclusion of process flow diagrams, a documentation 
of a step-by-step -step process at some level. So this innovation also includes for each of these process flow diagrams a button where you can click on the system and get at the metrics, the measurements of performance, productivity, if you will. So this is uh, where I got hooked into this system. Now I'd like to share a little bit more with you. It was interesting to think about this model of production as the way they manage their business. It's not just the technology. The model unites the people in the boardroom as well as the people who are on the shop floor. I observed through the miracles of a virtual tour of their factory, I saw how the people in the production viewed the process and how they had the exact same screen at their workplace that I saw over Cheryl's shoulder and over Gordon's shoulder in Van Nuys. They use this tool to teach the system, to teach people how to communicate with each other about the possibilities that are present in their production. So I also asked and, and gratefully received, they've used this process before at another company. This same tool, the same operating system was part and parcel of the force protection industries. And you can see the same kind of flow, the same kind of processes involved. They were different processes, but the idea was that here are the feedback loops. This is the way we get information back to the management and the leadership of the organization is through our production processes and through the process flow diagrams that, that occur at the lowest level of functionality in the organization. So thinking about that, the central concept is exactly the same. The name and processes are different for obvious reasons, a different business. They have a same operating system though. They manage by Dr. Deming's production viewed as a system. It's just what is a, applicable to the business that they're in. It's also something that we heard about from TJ's presentation and we've heard this word a few times these last two days is the fractal nature of the way their, their system works. They connect everything together at the system level and you can replicate the system as you dig deeper within and as you go up or down in detail, you see the same thing. You see the connection from step by step of the process or the specific process flow diagram. So with this definition of fractal, I wanna make sure that you understand that my view of this diagram is that it's very similar the fractal nature is very similar to um, the, the work done through the API folks a uh, generation ago with linkage of processes. Within that work, linkage of processes by associates and process improvement, you may recall that they talked about guiding or directing processes. They also talked about the mainstay or the value adding processes and then the support or administrative processes. And they had a methodology to get at what was the connection in linking the processes. And this operating system through the fractal nature permits the exact same view of what affects what else. So I'd like to encourage you to think about this. Starting from a system view, you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper to understand what are the processes at work, what are the differences that are made in the production system that both uh, Force Protection System and Jet Hot have used. From the process to process flow diagrams, looking at this systems view has a strong power associated with understanding what affects what else. So I urge you to think about this and I'd like to open up because we have a few minutes yet I would like to hear your questions and have the folks from Jet Hot say a few words about them. So thinking about the, the closing things that I would like to point out before we get to those questions is I'd like to talk about the joy in work. Everybody that I've talked to, and I haven't talked to all of the people that have worked at Jet Hot, but the people I have talked to are enthusiastic about the work that they do. The first time I met each of these individuals that works for Jad Hot, I was 
delighted that they found it necessary to tell me about their role in the big picture and to tell me what the big picture was, too. It sounded, when I talked to James on the production line the first time, it sounded like I was hearing from Gordon and Cheryl. I'd heard the same words when I talked to Ken. And so this idea of what it is that people find in their work, that they find joy in, is that they were engaged in the aim of the system. This was something I found quite remarkable and worth emulating. I urge you to think of your questions. And if you would, let me make one last point. I went through the 14-point checklist, and I validated against the people who I connected with at Jet Hot, and I was pleased to say I found evidence of that culture on the Jet Hot shop floor matched Dr. Deming's 14 points. Think about that. They do all 14 points. Now, they may say we don't do them perfectly. That is a level of humility that we all ought to emulate. None of us in the room are perfect. And it's important for us to think about how they still try. So what questions do you have for us? Yes, and Dan, you have a question? Uh, yeah, how, how are new employees when their uh, former employer is in contact introduced to uh, Dr. Deming's teachings when they come into the company? How are new employees, contract or permanent, introduced to Dr. Deming's teachings? Use the microphone and repeat the question. The question was, how are new employees introduced to Dr. Deming's teachings? We do that even with our TAMP employees. Um, when they come in, even if they're only going to be employed with us for a month, they still need to know what we're talking about, speak the same language. Um, we put them through a training, introducing our Jet Hot system to them and the various parts of the system and how they fit into that system while they're employed with us. Another question, please. Yeah, I just wanted to tag on a little bit to that question. So if it's somebody who's their full-time permanent, they'll go through 40 hours of theory and 40 hours of tools, and we'll actually teach people how to navigate app tool in the system. For people that are um, contract workers or temp workers, um, we actually set a curriculum, and we, we go step-by-step -step through what is a system, and we use the tool and that systems diagram to say the name, the aim, the boundaries, what it all means, the interdependencies that our job is to optimize the entire system, not just one component, and to take them through individual process flow diagrams, have them make it with post-it notes first, so they can see that whatever is in the computer, it's really just a way of thinking and approaching the job the, the software makes it easier, but it's a change in thinking first. And so even if they're not gonna be there for a long period of time, we have to give them something, because this is the language we speak. So it would be like somebody coming in and we're all speaking Italian, and they don't speak Italian. Unfair, it would be a barrier, right? And we have to remove barriers for people. And so we remove the barrier of them not understanding our language by no matter who it is, they have to get a certain amount of training. So, um, you know, so it, it can happen at all different levels, but we have a disciplined way and a curriculum set up to actually indoctrinate them into our way of thinking. And then we use the tools, but it's really first, this is the way we think around here. I'm interested in that four weeks that you described, like in early on, how you, I mean, you're describing where you are now, but when you were faced with all that crisis, did you use Deming? I mean, how did you evolve into this and manage to rise to that, those challenges? Well, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that, and 
you know, Gordon, Gordon may need to chime in with that. And um, from my perception, and I came in partway through that process, um, and so from my perception, the first thing is we had constancy of purpose. We knew who we were and where we were going as a company. Um, and we had a visionary leader who understood we were a system and we could do more than what we realized if we cooperated, right? Dr. Deming talks about cooperation. So because there wasn't siloed thinking and because everyone was cooperating cross-functionally, um, it, it was a matter of we had to cooperate to survive. And so we had a situation, we had that, you know, Tripp had mentioned this the other day. It, we had moments where it was the gift of desperation, and I wasn't there in the middle of all of it. I came in while they were well into it, but I was, I was there seeing the output of all of that. And so at that time, you have to have somebody who's visionary and who understands this, and it was like learning it trial by fire in some, in some kind of a way, really. Dennis, you mentioned uh, James a, a number of times, and I'd be interested, James, in what your experience was like when you first um, heard about this new approach that was going to be very, very different from what you had been doing beforehand. I'm assuming you were working with Chet Hot before, and uh, I'd be interested to know what that uh, experience was like in those early days. Yes, um, first, um, I came into Jet Hot, I've been there about three and a half years. So when I first came, it was already, the um, Demi was already instituted. Now, being that I had jobs before, you know, coming into this one, um, it was different. You know, to me it was more hands-on, um, more learning involved in the job, you know, um, Two things I always say when we get new employees, you know, I ask them, is they willing to work and willing to learn? Because in this system, you have to learn just as much as you work. I think that's very important. You know, we get a lot of people may come in the door with a minimal education. And then with that being, you train them. You train them with the um, computer programs. You train them how to I don't want to, I want to say this kind of loosely, but how to think. You know, um, we're more than just putting you in a corner, telling you this is what you do and we leave you there. Um, what we try to do is show you the whole system, the whole operations of the company. Then that way, each person that comes in get a feel of what we do. You know, just not one section, not just one coder or one blaster or a mask. We try to show you the whole entire system, the whole big picture, you know, what our aim is, you know, the language that we talk, the things that we do. Um, we put a lot of time into that. Now, me, I am a trainer. So by the time I get a new employee, they go through uh, Miss Cindy. Once um, they leave H&R with Miss Cindy, now when I get them on the floor, they're more familiar with our system. So that makes it a lot easier. And each time you know you deal with an employee, you start to train them in the way of thinking. You know how to process what we do. You know how to um, deal with um, the app tool, things like that. On top of just training them to do the job, because if you look as um, Dennis was doing, the system is the job. You teach them how to navigate through the system, what the system means what's going on in the system, you're teaching them the job. Just to add to that, um, excuse me, I, I scored a 98% on the Myers-Briggs introvert test. <laughs> uh, this is extremely painful for me to be up here. Um, somebody, somebody said real quick, do it for me, and um, I will tell him you owe me. But the, the truth is I am doing it for my team. Um, 
Sorry, my feet get sweaty, my mouth gets dry, so if I put my foot in my mouth, you'll know what I'm doing. <laughs> Somebody caught on to that, that's good. Um, just wanted to add on to what James was saying. We found uh, with the, um, the four-day training that is really a two-week training because we do a, a week of the tools after the initiation of, of introducing the Deming theories. Um, with that, we wanted to bring groups in because that's a lot of time out of production. And so we would bring large groups in and, and go through that. But there were, there were gaps between these groups that we were having. So that's what James was talking about when he said he gets them from Cindy. When an employee comes in, very first day, one off, they, they immediately start to learn the language that we use. What is a special cause? because we use these terms. What is common cause? Um, how do they affect, what is a PFD? You're gonna hear that word all the time, it's a process flow back. What is an FMEA and how does that relate to a PFD? And that's the type of training that um, Cindy does. I, I think that will help answer the question that you were asking earlier too. Um, so that part of the training, uh, we, we had to, we recognized where there was something wrong and um, continual improvement is not just for simple processes, it's for people too. And so that's what we tried to institute is um, perfecting our people through trainings um, and respect. Hi, um, I was just wondering you see the production as a system, viewed as a system. Do you also integrate training of new people, for example, into that system? And my second question is, with that uh, production viewed as a system, on the left hand you would have your suppliers. What kind of training did you have to give to your suppliers, if any? Because they will need to be, they are part of the system too. Well, why would you give them any other training? So our suppliers are invited to our four days. We do a Deming four day. They're invited to our uh, 40 hours of tool training. The guy that does the landscaping at our facility has been through our four days. Um, as a result of doing that, he went back and changed the way he ran his business. As a result of changing the way he ran his business, he made more money. Because he was making more money, he could reduce his prices. He could reduce his prices because he was competing with every kid in the neighborhood that had a lawnmower. He can now compete with them on a price basis. And guess what he did? He lowered the price to us. When we call him up and have a conversation with something, um, I can't imagine the last time we had a conversation. I just know that I went in one day and there was a bunch of Japanese maple across the front of the facility. I went to accounting and said, how much did the Japanese maples cost us? Nobody knows. We never got an invoice. There's a woman who is a widow that lives directly outside of our parking lot. Um, her husband died. She lives by herself. She has no support system. Um, we like to be good neighbors. Um, I happened to mention to him that we were going to go over and clean up her yard and she has an old shed and there's some broken concrete and we were going to haul it away. Next thing you know, some trucks show up. Uh, he picks up the concrete, he cleans her yard, he plants flowers in her yard. She comes out crying. Why would you do, you know, look, this, this, this is old stuff. This was all done in 1980 in Detroit, right? There isn't, we're not doing anything different here. We're not doing, here's some things. This is easier than the alternative by every measure. It's easier to teach, it's easier to understand, it's easier to practice, and it works. That's the only difference between this and the traditional style of management. No one that works in the company has a boss. Nobody reports to anyone else. They don't have job titles. We don't have job descriptions, we don't have departments. We're just there to delight customers. And the system is designed to do that. It's not a social science experiment. 
but we have a rare workforce. They have a, a set of really rare attributes. They have post-traumatic post stress syndrome. I have people who have been incarcerated in the past. I have people that are so old that no one will give them a job. I have kids that are so young that they are the first of four generations to get a paycheck from any place except the mailbox. I have people with physical and mental disorders. We have some rudimentary tasks that can be performed. The system needs to have those performed. We don't write job descriptions. We don't write specifications for people. We bring people in and find out what it is they like to do and what they're good at, and we make a job out of it. So we, we don't do anything that you are supposed to do in a business, and it works great. The, the Deming system or process seems to be simple yet intricate. I just wanted to ask, like, in the very beginning, how are you guys able to weed out the people that you know will or will not work with your system? Because everybody looks good on paper, but the whole hiring and firing process can get costly emotionally and monetarily. Thank you, I'm glad you asked the question. Um, so here's the thing. Um, initially, you have no idea who's gonna work out and who's not, right? I mean, initially, we don't know. Um, I'll speak for myself, when I showed up there, I wasn't qualified to do the job that, that I was asked to do. And it's not because I wasn't a willing worker and willing to work hard, and, and I did come with some experience, but I hadn't worked in the industry we worked in. But James pretty much pointed it out. Are you willing to work, which I was, and are you willing to learn, which I was? Um, and the people that aren't, it'll become obvious. And the reality is, most of the time, they know they're not a fit. They really know that they're not a fit. But the important thing for us is, and the, the diagram isn't up there, but it goes from a system to a subsystem to a singular process flow diagram. The job is to focus on creating a good system. If we all focus on cooperating together to create a good system, that becomes the focus. And so much of the stuff that people worry about actually falls away because what's creating it is the system that they're working in. So it, it, it most of the time, it really isn't that there's bad people. It's that it's great people that are willing workers and they're in a system that prevents them from rising to the occasion. So the ones that don't work out, the numbers are small and you know, build your business around that. When it happens, you become aware of it. Either they select out or you respectfully invite them to move along somewhere else. But I will stress the respectfully invite them out of the system, but we're really patient. It takes a long time because sometimes you have to understand what somebody's gift is and you can't learn that on day one. So you let people have access to the information, let them have a view of the entire system, let them try some things in the system to make sure we're not overlooking a gem because they got put in one spot, but they're really gifted somewhere else. And really, that's the responsibility. The responsibility of management is to design and operate a system that optimizes, it, to design and operate an optimal system, right? And so the people, if given a chance, will do that. I mean, that, that's what we were all given is a chance. And in order to pay that back, we tried to continue to create a good system. Is our introvert going to say one more thing? That's a good question. I asked Gordon that. Um, 
I, I'm not an employee. I, I have an uh, automotive aftermarket company that had, uh, as, a, as a result of that, I ended up at a trade show, and that's where I met Gordon. Um, so we're, we're in a similar industry, but I'm a very small one-man company. And um, I started talking to Gordon about all my great ideas for my company, and he started asking me a lot of questions, and I realized I needed to, to, uh, to, to listen to what he had to say. And so I ended up going down to Jet Hot for a day, and then I ended up going down for a couple of weeks to do the, the two four-day courses. And um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm an outsider, and I, I've seen what's going on down there. But my experience beforehand is in manufacturing. I've spent a lot of time in uh, factories, and I've never seen a place that runs like Jet Hot. I've never seen a place so quiet, uh, so free of stress. Uh, nobody's running around, and uh, everybody just seemed happy. It was very weird. So, uh, I, I guess that's what I'm here to, to relay. <laughs> Talk about the, uh, the view from the outside, the, the rumor. Oh, <laughs> so there's a, um, Gordon and I, we, we both, and, and Judd Hot, of course, operate in the automotive aftermarket. We all have a lot of friends in the automotive aftermarket with all these old muscle cars. And uh, I was at a shop recently talking to some guys that do some really great work, and they were asking about how to, be more efficient and improve their company. And I was like, well, you, you guys know Gordon over there at Jet Hot, right? And the guy's like, yeah. I said, well, you know, he's helping me figure out how to run my business. And, you know, I've learned all the dumbing principles from him, to, or trying to master them anyway. Um, and he's like, yeah, I, I, I know about Jet Hot. I said, well, why don't you talk to Gordon? I mean, you know him as a person. He's like, well, we've heard that uh, Jet Hot is actually a money laundering operation. <laughs> he said, there's, there's no way they can be making that much money over there. Your secret's out. <laughs> Without further questions, I think we are at that time limit. I want to thank you, and I want to thank the Jet Hot team for telling us more about your operating system. Thank you very much.